I'm going to talk about, um, I know it's genomic technologies, I'm going to talk about kind of a use of uh, sort of post-processed genomic technologies in the context of, um, of uh, pan-genomes and the applications of pan-genomes. Um, in the specific application I'll talk about today is copy number analysis. Now, Friday I'm going to give another talk that gets into the weeds on actually sequencing and assembling a pan-genome. We're just going to assume that's all done uh, today, okay? So it's kind of out of order, but um, that's okay. Okay, so um, how many people here are familiar with copy number variation in genetics in, in general? Okay, so uh, a lot of people. So all of our genes can vary, our genomes can vary both by single base changes as well as uh, large changes in our DNA that can increase or decrease the number of counts of certain genes that we have. And so this is a gene, um, uh, HPR, that um, uh, undergoes, quote, quote, runaway copy number expansions. So some individuals can have up to six copies per uh, haplotype and some um, uh, where the reference only has one and many individuals uh, uh, have two. Okay, so what are the uh, impacts of copy number variation? So kind of in a, in a simple setting, it can impact, say, just expression, where if you increase the counts of a gene, you can measure more expression of that gene. Okay. And this is just a few scatter plots that show um, from a paper by Bob Hansiker in 2015 that shows you increase copy number of certain genes, you get more expression of those genes. But that's not always the case. Okay, there's a classic example of SMN, which has two copies uh, in the genome, uh, in the standard, in the, in the reference genome in most individuals, um, where there's SMN1 and SMN2. And SMN2 has been partially pseudogenized by a single SNP in one of the exons that causes the gene to not be expressed. Okay, so if you have a gene and it doesn't make either a functional transcript, or the, it doesn't uh, get, um, uh, if it, it doesn't have any expression, it's, just, it's pseudogenized. So it's, it's a gene, it looks like a gene, it has the, um, uh, it gets spliced sometimes like a gene, but it doesn't have any actual function. So in the case of SMN, uh, this, this single SNP um, r results in essentially, uh, um, getting rid of most of the expression of that, that particular gene. And it turns out that if you can take your SMN2 gene and go through a process of gene conversion where it's essentially a copy paste over sort of genomic modification where SMN2 can get converted, or sorry, SMN1 can get converted into SMN2, you can lose expression of both copies. Okay, so, and that results in a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Okay, so this is a case where increasing the gene counts um, if you don't pay attention to say which copy of the gene that you're increasing count of, doesn't necessarily increase the expression of that gene. Okay, so um, historically, uh, discovering copy number variants is very technology dependent, okay? So it can be done with microarrays where uh, you can run a microarray on a sample and depending on the intensity of the probes, you can call additional copies where additional copies of sequences give you additional uh, probe intensity. Um, and then with uh, short read sequencing and next-gen sequencing, you can take reads, map them back to a genome, and where you see excess read depth, um, uh, you can have uh, additional copy number variants that you call in your data set. And so um, this can be problematic in, uh, for, for uh, CNV analysis with short reads. So we problematic in uh, repetitive DNA um, uh, for reasons that I'll talk about shortly. Um, and it's also doubly problematic because copy number variants of genes are enriched in repetitive DNA. Okay. Uh, the main problem with repetitive DNA is it's difficult to align short read sequences to repetitive DNA to confidently align and essentially count how many copies of the sequence that you have. So what are two strategies? Well, one is to take your sequencing read, use some methods that John Alkin developed, and map your read uh, to as many possible places in the genome as it, can, as it can align to. And now, instead of having to decide between any individual copy that has been duplicated, you can kind of get a global view of all different copies 
that may have been uh, uh, amplified in the genome. Or you can essentially limit your uh, sequencing reads to those that align over what are called uh, paralogous sequence variants. So these are variants that are in a copy of a duplication that are fixed in a population and missing from the other copies of the duplication. So they uniquely identify uh, the, the duplicated sequence. So if you see excess depth over a particular position that distinguish it from, distinguishes it from other copies, <coughs> you can declare a variant at that particular, uh, uh, say an extra copy of that gene at that position. Okay, so some problems of this. Uh, so if you're doing this multi-mapping of reads back to uh, the genome, this can obscure which particular uh, paralog has been duplicated. Um, and if you're relying on um, these paralogous sequence variants, uh, if you have genes with, say, few paralogous sequence variants, specifically few that are fixed in the population, or you have kind of population variation, it can kind of obscure some of the in inferences that you can make um, with this paralog specific uh, variant analysis. Okay. Um, it also, we'll kind of go over a high level view of what we would like to actually get out of kind of an idealized copy number uh, a detection method. Okay, so on the top, I'm just showing a genome that has, say, two different paralogs of the same gene. So this is a gene that has very high, or two copies of a gene that have high identity to it. Maybe they have the uh, uh, same function. Okay, new genome, if we have the same gene at the same position, we can call them orthologous. If we have an extra copy of that gene, we call this a paralogous uh, duplication. And there's all sorts of sort of different combinations of genomic architectures that we are uh, interested in trying to uh, find copy number variants in. So maybe we have a particular haplotype that's highly diverged from the reference, and we'd like to know whether or not the diverged haplotype is the copy that's been uh, duplicated. Or we can have this uh, events where we have this gene conversion, where we have this copy paste over event that can happen. <coughs> and we want to know if, if this is the particular uh, type of variant that's been, um, yeah. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Yeah, of course. Like, so I'm familiar with two kinds of paralogs that you're describing. Like one would be, say, actin or tubulin, where mm -hmm. there's actually, <coughs> they're paralogs, but there is sequence that distinguishes them uniquely from each other. Right. Another would be a ribosomal repeat array, where right. there's actually like almost identical, if not identical, repeats. Right. And for the first case, it seems that mapping does allow, you know, you to distinguish the two, right. whereas mapping would not. Definitely. So what's interesting is those are two different time. So, well, <coughs> we have different variant, different copies of DNA happening at different time frames in terms of demography and um, and uh, sort of population drift. So uh, the uh, the actin case, that's something that happened kind of a long time ago and maybe has a large enough divergence that they've even diver picked up in new functions entirely. And those, the reads typically will align to with, with enough um, uh, confidence that you can detect. Essentially, there's no difficult methods that are required. There's, say, one variant every 100 to 200 bases, and reads are confidently aligned to individual copies. What we're interested in are genes that are copy number variable within the human population. And those have happened recent enough that they frequently don't have very many distinguishing variants in them. But I'll show examples where they, um, uh, when, you, when you have the full pan genome, that gives you an idea of what the overall variation looks like. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, what is a, keep track of time. Um, okay, so what's a resource that's come out recently that's going to help us with copy number variation uh, discovery? Uh, it's the development of a uh, new human pan genome. So this is a figure from um, the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium, and it's showing uh, a group of 44 assemblies that have been created um, on a set of diverse uh, uh, human uh, individuals. And um, on the right side, we're showing uh, essentially a metric of how the quality of the assemblies, um, showing the contiguity of the assemblies by, by total uh, length of the assembly. <coughs> and in dark 
line here is the GRCH38 reference. You don't have to worry too much about what these plots are. The key sort of take home message is that the majority or many of the genomes that are assembled <coughs> have the same sort of metric of contiguity as the current HG38 uh, reference of the human genome. So highly contiguous uh, genomes that are assembled, which means that a lot of the duplicated sequences in these genomes are assembled into the pan genome uh, that was released a, a few months ago by the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. <coughs> so in this, um, in these assemblies, we can find essentially sequence resolved copy number variants. And so here are two dot plots of, from two different uh, regions of different assemblies. And it's basically showing two genes that have undergone expansions. So this is uh, a gene Spidey2, and this is a gene uh, GPRIN2. In this case, there's one extra copy of GPRIN2. In this case, there's two extra copies of this Spidey2 uh, gene. <clears throat> and importantly, they're sequence resolved, okay? So what is that? Oh, uh, a couple more uh, sort of points to make about this. So within these 44 uh, genomes, they're haplotype resolved, so 88 different assemblies. Um, we have a large number of, uh, of uh, additional genes that are assembled, or addif additional copies of genes assembled into these genomes between 20 and all the way up to uh, 140. <clears throat> and the genes don't just have sort of single one extra copy duplications. There's sort of highly polymorphic, high copy number genes that are assembled into the human pan genome uh, reference. Okay, so uh, let's dive into one particular gene family. So SMN, that gene that I talked about before, that, um, that, can, that has two different paralogs, SMN1 and 2, and the SMN2 is the low copy, uh, sorry, low expression. And here's a heat map um, uh, in the center that sort of shows the relative similarity of different copies of SMN1 SMN, uh, extracted from the HPRC, the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium Assemblies, and SMN2. <clears throat> and then a set of other sort of more diverse copies that are the result of these gene conversion events where parts of SMN1 are copied over to SMN2 and vice versa, SMN2 copied back over to SMN1. Okay, and on the right is a variant plot. Okay, and every little dot that's shown here reflects a difference that's found in that sequence relative to the other uh, copies, um, oops, of, uh, of these, uh, of the genes in the other uh, assemblies. <coughs> okay, so a question is how do we take advantage of this huge new database of sequence resolved copy number uh, variants, uh, or sorry, sequence resolved duplicated sequences uh, to, to try and discover copy number variation in larger data sets. So say the 1000 Genomes data set or eventually the UK Biobank, okay. So uh, first, so some of the goals, well we need to be um, flexible so that it can genotype copy number variants in sort of diverse uh, copies and fast. So fast often means alignment free analysis, which usually is kind of a synonym for KMER based analysis. So what do we do? <clears throat> so our approach is generally to, to catalog KMERs that are specific to the genes themselves, um, or sorry, the gene family. So found in the family and not elsewhere in the genome. Okay, so we're specifically not looking for paralog specific variants. We're looking for variants just within the gene family. They don't have to be specific within any individual. And later we'll be looking for essentially combinations of, of copies that, uh, 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 combinations of variants that when added together are essentially specific. Um, and what we'd like to say is do combinations of genes from this list sort of agree with what we have in say an Illumina based sample. Okay. <coughs> so how do we do this? Well, first step is to take our collection of genomes and um, find all copies of a gene. Okay, so given some gene that we're interested in that might be copy number variable in a population, we wanna find all the copies of it. We had to kind of construct our own sort of uh, custom method to do this. I don't wanna get into too much detail. We take the genes, we kind of make, find some uh, matching seeds and, and search those across the genome. Take the, the 
initial hits that we found and then do some sort of sensitive alignment and sort of post-processing to find kind of like a maximally inclusive set of, uh, of uh, uh, copies of, of genes. Okay, so now here's where the important part starts. So given a list of copies of a gene or all of the different paralogs of the gene and all the different assemblies that we have, we extract the k-mers that are specific to the set of genes that we found, okay? We just kind of have this large collection of k-mers. And we turn the collection of k-mers into what we call a k-mer matrix M, okay? So this matrix has uh, one column for every k-mer. So we have one matrix per gene, roughly. Okay, if a gene's really large, we'll split it into a few different matrices, but one matrix per gene. Every column is a k-mer that's in that gene. And every row corresponds to one of the copies of the genes that we found, okay? Also what we're going to do is we're gonna take an Illumina data set and we're gonna scan through the Illumina data set and we're gonna count how often the k-mers uh, in that particular k-mer matrix appear in that data set and we're gonna turn that into um, an observation vector v. Okay, so v represents how often we've seen each of the k-mers up here in an Illumina or short read data set uh, there. Okay, and um, the objective, what we'd like to say is that any individual that we find, if our pan genome is kind of inclusive enough in terms of human populations, is that any individual is gonna be some combination, their genes and their genome, is gonna be some combination of genes from the pan genome or rows in this matrix, possibly uh, seeing one row multiple times. Okay, and that represents a copy number uh, increase in the individual relative to say the pan genome. So how do we solve for that? Well, what we can do is we can say that, that these alleles that we find in that individual correspond to some sort of ground truth copy number vector, which just stores how often we, each of these alleles occurs in our sample genome, okay? And we can just say that um, if we just multiply the expected coverage times uh, this uh, uh, copy number matrix, um, times the camera matrix plus some noise, that's gonna equal the observations that we have from our uh, Illumina data set. Do you yeah. have any constraints on the sums of the row sums of X? The, like as in, in this, like when you solve for... We're, so we're solving for, for X. X, yeah, yes, when you positive. X, but just positivity, so yeah. it could be that you estimate like 100 different copies. Yeah, yeah, so it's just, we just want to find a maximum likelihood estimate for X. I'm constrained. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so our input is the short read coverage, um, and then the uh, camera counts from that V and this allele matrix M. We basically want to minimize this expression here. Okay. X here is uh, copy numbers, which are integers. Uh, that forms an integer linear program, so obviously we can't do that. Um, and so uh, for now what we do is we essentially estimate x using uh, real valued coefficients and then we look at the phylogeny of the, the genes and we use that to try and essentially group together coefficients to estimate final copy number. Um, we'll skip over that. How are we doing? We're doing okay on time. Okay, so what does that look like? So say we have this little toy phylogeny where we had five different alleles in our full matrix M. And um, if we f find this estimate for X that's just uh, focused on, on or constrained to positive numbers, we might have one allele showing up with uh, uh, um, coefficient 0.49 and another allele with coefficient 0.45 and they're neighbors to each other in the tree. And so there may be highly similar sequences. And so the regression kind of assigns roughly equal weight to both of those um, uh, uh, alleles. Well, we say, okay, well, roughly equal, but B is a little bit better. So we can essentially project the weight that was given to A onto B. And if it's close enough to an integer copy number, we can say, okay, uh, we have copy number B is one in, the, in this individual. Okay. And um, in a slightly more complicated case, we can do the same thing where we might project and sort of over project some of the uh, coefficient to, um, uh, to a particular allele. 
we have ways of kind of accounting for that that I won't uh, fully get into. But essentially what we do, the high level overview of what we do is to uh, essentially recursively assign weight from leaves to neighbors um, in the phylogeny of, of alleles until we get to copy numbers that are close enough to integer copy numbers. Okay, so how do we test this? Okay, oof, I gotta really go through this really fast. So, uh, can, I, can I go like three minutes over? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so to test this, we took about 2,400 different genes that were found to be copy number variable in the human pan genome, uh, uh, first release of the human pan genome. That defined about 2,700 different uh, Kamer matrices M based on, say, the, the length of, of reads. Um, uh, the camera matrix M has all copies of a gene, plus we include kind of extra bait sequences that are similar enough to the genes that we have in our table that they would kind of uh, throw off our copy number estimates, okay? And um, the first test to do is to essentially calculate Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium uh, for, oh, I should say, sorry. Um, we, uh, oh, I didn't show this here. So we are genotyping Illumina data from the 1,000 Genomes Project. So it says 1,000 genomes, but we're up to about 3,000 individuals that are sequenced uh, for the 1,000 Genomes Project. And so we're taking the Illumina data from that, estimating the copy numbers of different genes, and then um, uh, essentially going forward with downstream analysis with, with that result. So how many people here have used, say, Heidi-Weinberg equilibrium to study, say, genotyping results or um, Okay, so Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says that, uh, let's say we have an allele, it can have two different values, little a, big A, little a has frequency P, then we should expect to see um, the genotypes little a, little a, little a, big A, and uh, big A, big A with probabilities or frequencies P squared, 2P, 1 minus P, and 1 minus P squared. Okay, <coughs> and so what you can do is essentially count how often you see an allele genotyped in the data set, and also count how often you see uh, heterozygous alleles in that data set. And it should follow this sort of um, uh, inverse uh, parabola, and the result of the genotyper is more or less the inverse parabola. And it's, doing this check is kind of a convenient way to see if your method makes sense or not. This is just some kind of a clip from uh, uh, my uh, students development where um, when you have a bunch of results that are sort of off the, the main um, uh, parabola, specifically sort of on these diagonals, that's an indication that you're overcalling heterozygous or homozygous events. And so essentially the, the advising that I did was he showed me this and I said, these must be wrong, fix it. I don't know what you did that's wrong. He came back to me a day later. He had more, some of these spots removed. And he said, oh, I found some bugs. I said, nope, fix it again. And um, uh, he found another bug. And so then the current data set, the current results essentially follow um, what is expected by uh, uh, population genetics. Okay, there is a caveat here though. Uh, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium test works for biallelic uh, events. Copy number uh, variants are uh, often categorized as multiallelic because you have additional uh, states that a single locus can be in. Um, and so you can't use the standard Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium test with just a biallelic variant uh, to test your data. But what's going on here is that um, because the assemblies that we have actually included inside of them have many of the copy number variants that actually occurred in the entire population, instead of genotyping extra copies, we're essentially assigning which alleles different um, individuals have. And so for the most part, what we're saying is that these uh, copy number variants, or sorry, the, the, the resulting um, alleles that we find are um, either reference uh, heterozygous or uh, uh, copy number two. And so since the majority of the data is just in this range, it actually follows what you'd expect in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. <coughs> okay. I'll kind of glide through a little bit more of the benchmarking. There aren't that many kind of other existing methods that work on pan genomes and do copy number analysis, so we can't sort of have the table against other methods. What we do is essentially count 
look at the assemblies that we have, say they're pretty close to ground truth, and we count how often genes appear in these assemblies, then we count how often we uh, estimate that specific copy number of genes um, in Illumina data, and we just essentially compare the two. Okay, so TLDR, the short version of this is that the majority of the tests that we do have zero difference between the copy numbers that we estimate in, from Illumina data versus the copy numbers that we count in the assemblies. And so in the first case, we did the easiest possible case where we have the same assembly in the pan genome as the Illumina data that we have that we're testing with. In the second case, we have, we remove the uh, assembly in the pan genome that corresponds to the Illumina data and retest. And essentially we still get, um, we get a few more errors, but most of the data has no difference between the genotype allele and what we expect, uh, the, the essentially the closest matched uh, allele. <coughs> um, okay, uh, I'll just kind of, one result of this is, um, so here, the result of using a pangenome to do your analysis is essentially less reference bias. And so here, we're taking Illumina reads, and we're mapping them back to HG38, and you can see a lot of different positions where there are differences between the read and the genome. Here, what we take are the two different alleles that our genotype or method essentially selected by this camera analysis. We remapped reads to them, and um, these are alignment errors. The small differences here are alignment errors. So what you can see is that when there aren't alignment errors, the reads map essentially without any difference back to what we're seeing. So that's just a, another sort of check that we genotype the alleles that, that are the correct uh, alleles. Um, okay, I won't get into too much biological results. Um, this is kind of a, a global view of amylase copy number variation. Amylase is a gene. Um, amylase 1 is uh, uh, expressed in um, salivary glands. Amylase 2 is in the pancreas. Both are for digesting starches. Different studies have shown them in <coughs> uh, conflicting whether or not they're related to diabetes. This is essentially a global view of copy number variation of amylases um, from the 1,000 Genomes data uh, for the different uh, um, architectures that were assembled in the human pangenome uh, reference. What's interesting about this is um, depending on which, say, global population you look at, um, Eurasian, Amerindian, East Asian, South Asian, and African, um, each of them has sort of a dominant uh, haplotype that represents, uh, say, amylase 2. And so whatever, say, a, any linear reference is that you pick, for one, uh, if you picked a single linear reference for all of your studies, um, uh, you would only have one population that would be the major sort of allele within the linear reference, and all other populations would uh, essentially suffer from uh, reference bias. Um, and I won't get into too much detail. We have a bit of a story on genotyping SMN where we're essentially able to show, um, what's shown here is an analysis of expression of SMN1 in relation to both SMN1 and SMN2 copy numbers. And um, so essentially, if you sort of compare dots within the same diagonal, they're the same copy number. What you can see is that over here you have, and, and more red or slash light blue means you have higher expression. And uh, so here, as you increase SMN1 copy number, you increase SMN1 expression. This is as expected. Um, over here, as you increase a certain paralog of SMN2 uh, copy number, you also get an increase of SMN1 expression. So this is a case where um, just simply genotyping, say, SMN1 or a specific version of SMN2, you don't have the full background for the genomic architecture that's contributing to uh, SMN1 expression. Um, okay, so uh, big thanks to the Human Pangena Reference Consortium that's generating all of these data and assemblies that I'll talk more detail about kind of the process of how the pangenome was made on Friday. Um, and a quick summary, so our method's called C-Typer. It uh, genotypes copy number uh, uh, variation using uh, gene-specific camera matrices. 
Um, uh, we'll skip to this last point. The kind of nicest thing about the method is it's, it's super efficient. And so it takes about an hour per, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, yeah, about an hour per thread per sample. And so say on UK Biobank, we're able to process that um, for about three or four thousand dollars. So uh, essentially, we have these pretty pictures of sort of the, the global distributions of certain alleles, but the main objective of this one of being to go and do association analysis of copy number variants with uh, traits in the UK Biobank. Um, that's about a month away, so I don't have that yet here. Um, any questions that you guys have? 